Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Happy Monday. Matt, you want to start us off? You have do you want me do you want me to step do you want me to do you want me to say anything about <coughs> do want, NATO expansion? Do you want me to step out for a minute to give you a second to start your recording, which is what I think you're doing? <laughs> Stalling uh, for time. Well, you know, I'm just wondering if you don't have anything to say about um, Sweden. We certainly Hungary welcome the uh, we certainly do welcome the vote uh, in the um, uh, Hungarian parliament today and look forward to it being finalized and are, are ready to receive the instruments here in Washington and welcome Sweden as the uh, 32nd member of NATO. Okay, <coughs> so you're waiting for the formal? Yeah, we'll wait for the formal for process to conclude. The H Hungarian parliament voted, but that's not the end of the process. They have to formally, as I think you remember with the uh, Turkish vote a few weeks ago, they have to formally present the uh, instrument here, and then we deposit right. it in our vault. For and as far final. as you know, that that has it hasn't. Yet. It has not yet been finalized, and, and certainly hasn't been and presented you even to know us. Know if that's going to happen today? I do not anticipate it happening today. Okay. I think there are still a couple of uh, formalities that need to take place inside Hungary before they can be presented to us. Uh, okay, um, and then then just one other one, which is kind of way off, uh, you know, way off topic. But you, you, I'm sure you've seen the reports about this guy. Alexander Smirnov, Israeli U.S. dual citizen, is the guy who was an FBI informant, and he was just been ordered jailed. The only reason oh, I'm asking yeah, about it right. here is that um, he is a dual citizen. So I'm just wondering if there's been any contact with, with the, between the Israelis and you about consular access or anything like that. I'm not aware of any. I'll have to check and see. I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Come here. Hi, Matt. So I just want to ask about this uh, thing about Navalny. Um, one of his uh, close ally of him basically said uh, he was close to being freed in a prisoner swap. I mean, is there anything you can tell us about that? The U.S. did put forward a substantial proposal. I think it was you made it public in early December. Was he part of that? We put forward a proposal in early December to secure the release of <coughs> Paul Whelan and Evan Gershkovich, as we said at the time. I have always made it a practice from this podium, I think you've seen it across the United States government, not to, co not to comment on the details of our negotiations or the details of our work to try to secure the release of prisoners in Russia or in other countries. Uh, all I will say about this matter uh, is that we have long called for the release of Alexei Navalny, and that was our uh, position on the matter. Do you also, does the U.S. government also agree with the assessment of this ally that he was killed because he was close to being freed in a prisoner? Uh, I think, so I, I do not have any assessment on that, I don't have any comment on that specific, or specific assessment. As we have said, we believe that Vladimir Putin and the Russian government are responsible for his death, but I couldn't uh, comment beyond that. I have Gaza questions, but if anybody if other people want to do Navalny, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Could you just understand how this works? Is it even possible for the U.S. government to discuss uh, prisoner swap on his behalf without designating him, you know, a uh, wrongful detainer. You know, I don't want to try to get into uh, a hypothetical that's going to, uh, by necessity, implicate me commenting on a specific situation. As I said, I'm not going to do so. I'm going to refrain from. I'm just going to refrain from commenting on on any aspect of negotiations to secure the release of anyone around the world. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I... This is the question. Yeah. That... It contains a premise that I don't think is accurate. Is there any authority under which the U.S. can do, can fund, to make a determination that a non-U.S. No. citizen is a wrong, wrongfully? No, but I took Alex's question to me: Can we try to secure the release of people who That's are non-U.S. citizens? Which of which of course? Well, maybe I'm misunderstood. Which of course we can, but we, the wrongful detention statute only applies to U.S. citizens and uh, other U.S. nationals. I mean, as the Act, expands beyond the U.S. nationals, right, yeah. of which he was not. Can I He's come back to me. Go ahead. Yeah. We understand there were some early discussions on this front involving a potential swap for Navalny and U.S. citizens. Is there anything you can say about that? Uh, I, I'm just not going to speak. Conversations were happening. I'm not going to speak into either internal deliberations or our work to secure the release of people held overseas. As I said, we had long called uh, for Alexei Navalny's release. And were there any conversations with the Germans? Uh, I'm just not going to speak to our conversations with any of our diplomatic partners about the work that we do to try to secure the release of wrongfully detained Americans or others held around the world. But you don't deny it. 
but they're uh, I did not deny it, but I didn't confirm it. I didn't comment on it one way or the other, and you can read or not read whatever uh, you want. Sometimes people read things into that mistakenly, but no, I didn't comment on it at all. Have you put forward any additional proposals to the Russians for the release of the Americans since that initial one you spoke about? Uh, uh, our work to try to secure the release of Evan Gershkovich and Paul Whelan continues. It's something we are working on every day, trying to figure out the best way to secure their release. As it pertains to any further proposals or any further conversations, I just don't have anything to announce today. As I said, there are at times when we feel it's in our interest to make public uh, or in the interest of the work we're trying to do to make public certain details. Um, but beyond that, we typically try not to comment at all because we don't want to jeopardize the status of what are uh, very, si the very sensitive work that we're doing to try to secure their release. Uh, go ahead. Uh, is this Navalny? Let me, is this Navalny? Let, let, let me go. Let me, let, let me just close out on Navalny and I'll come to you next. Thank go, you. Go, go. It's not related to hostages, but it's related to Navalny. Um, uh, the question being, has the U.S. come to a determination at all as to whether the death of Navalny, Navalny was coincidental or a concerted effort by the Kremlin? I don't have any assessment to, to offer on the circumstances surrounding his death other than that the Russian government is responsible for it. Is, is the U.S. seeking to independently come to a conclusion as to whether <clears throat> his death was you know. We are always seeking more information uh, of, uh, about incidents of this nature. That's certainly true in this, in this, with respect to this incident, but I don't have any assessment to offer. Has there been diplomatic engagement with the Russian government to seek answers about Navalny specifically? I don't have any comment, any conversations to read out. Okay. Relatedly, there was, <coughs> there were reports um, from U.S. officials that the U.S. had engaged diplomatically on the matter of the anti-satellite capability that Russia has been developing. Can you provide any update as to whether the Russians have responded to that outreach? Uh, I'm not going to speak to those conversations. We do have the ability to deliver m uh, messages to Russia. We did engage in diplomatic out <coughs> outreach to Russia to make clear our concerns about their pursuit of an anti-satellite uh, capability. We've also had concerns with allies and partners of the United States, as well as, com as conversations with allies and partners of, of the United States, as well as conversations with other countries around the world who think we ought to be concerned about Russia's pursuit of this specific capability. Well, does the U.S. believe that it's making progress in altering the likely trajectory of what Russia may or may not do with this capability, um, either via the Russian government or with its partners? So all I will say about that, because then again, there, there are limits to what I can say. There's a very limited amount of information that's been declassified because of concerns that the intelligence community has about making more information public. Um, we have had what we feel to be very productive conversations with a range of countries around the world. Um, we think it is in, incumbent on other countries <coughs> who share our concern to make those concerns known. Uh, we expect that they will, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. I know Michelle had a question yeah. on Navalny. Yeah, go ahead. You guys are confusing me sitting far, at the back. back. There was no room. Yeah. Back to this There's video. There's a seat. You can come sit up front, walk in. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Two, three seats up front. I just wanted to go back to like the video itself because you say you don't like to have... Um, you don't like to publicize some of these negotiations, but these guys went out very publicly today and said that there was a deal. Are they wrong? Now, again, I don't want to comment uh, in, to any extent on this beyond what I already have. So, uh, go, I, I told Jani I would come to her next, Thank so go you. ahead. Thank you, uh, Ukraine and Russia and North Korea. Uh, first question regarding Ukraine's defense industry collapses. Has the U.S. confirmed anything about the Ukraine's internal defense industrial collapse, including artillery shells? So I'm not sure what specific report you're referring to. So there are report to that the Ukraine is involved in defense <clears throat> industrial collapse worth tens of billions of dollars, <clears throat> including the. Uh, I'm sorry, including the embezzlement of 100,000 artillery cells. So I haven't, um, I haven't seen that specific report to which you're referring, but we have long uh, engaged in conversations with the Ukrainian government about the need to take anti-corruption measures. We've seen them uh, take a range of measures to crack down on corruption over the last couple of years. We think there's more that we can, that they can do, and we're engaged in ongoing dialogue with them about that. that Secondly, uh, Russia is using North Korean ballistic missiles against Ukraine, as you know that. <clears throat> about China's role, uh, what role does the U.S. seek from China, which is uh, tolerating arms trade between North Korea and Russia, 
and uh, will you impose additional sanctions on China? So we have made it clear to a number of countries that we think that the increased um, uh, relationship when it comes to weapons sharing between North Korea and Russia ought to be a topic of concern, that North Korea's <clears throat> providing weapons to, to Russia for use on the battlefield in Ukraine ought to be a topic of concern, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Hamer, and then Leon will come to you next. And then so I'll, I'll go to Israel. I have a couple of questions, Matt. Um, on what Secretary said in Buenos Aires on Friday, um, he said the Israeli settlements are inconsistent with international law. So I'm wondering why the administration, why it took the administration three years to sort of make that point. Was that something that you guys believed at the beginning of the administration and somehow decided to wait? <clears throat> or, you know, you landed at this decision just last week. So I'll say two things. From a policy point of view, uh, we have always been clear that we believe settlements are a barrier to peace and that they weaken, not strengthen, Israel's security uh, and position in the region. <clears throat> As a legal question, it is, excuse me, I still have this cough. I've had it for a week or so now. Uh, as a legal question, it is something that had been under review here at the department for some time. And as you know, the secretary over the last several months has uh, embarked on a process to um, try to ensure lasting peace in the region, to establish an independent Palestinian state. And we thought that as we were engaged uh, in that important process, it was important to avoid any ambiguity about the U.S. position on this matter. And so that's why uh, he made the announcement he did on Friday. Right. You said that there was a review that's been underway. Can you can you say when that started? No, we, that at the... only that we had been looking at this question for some time. Right. And this is, I mean, I understand what you're saying um, in terms of you have said that it is an impediment to peace before, but saying that it is inconsistent with international uh, <coughs> law is like a step uh, sort of ahead of that, beyond that. What are you trying to achieve with this? Are you expecting that this would put some additional pressure on, uh, on Israel about the settlements, because this has been an ongoing uh, conflict <coughs> dispute between you and the Israeli government that you just can't seem to agree. So what we are trying to achieve is the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with security guarantees for Israel. That is the ultimate policy objective that we are trying to achieve. You've seen the secretary focus his diplomatic efforts on, on it. You've obviously heard me speak to that uh, a number of times from, from this podium. And so we thought, um, as we go about that process, it was important that we be uh, clear and avoid any ambiguity about this particular legal question. Would you have not said this uh, the way Secretary said it if you have seen Israeli government not uh, unveil or like not have any plans to sort of add new housing units? Could this have gone in a different way? Um, it's hard to speak to uh, a counterfactual, um, but we have seen the Israeli government uh, announce and explore new housing settlements, and we've had deep concerns about those. Uh, and as you heard the secretary say on Friday, we think the settlements that they've uh, announced prior to this date and the settlements that they announced they were exploring last week are fundamentally a barrier to peace. Have you given them a heads up before? Have you spoken to them privately since then? Uh, I'm sure that we've engaged in conversations about them. As you know, we engage in conversations with the Israeli government uh, at a number of different levels, but I'm not aware of any specific conversation around this. Matt, can I just ask you, you yeah. say that this removes ambiguity, but actually what it does is restores ambiguity, the ambiguity that was in the original Hansel Memorandum, which doesn't say that settlements are illegal. It says that they're inconsistent or illegitimate. It doesn't use the word illegal. So I'm not sure I understand how this removes it. It restores the previous ambiguity that had existed. Why don't you guys just come out and take a position once and for all? Are settlements okay? Or are <coughs> they actually, quote, quote, illegal under Internet. So I don't think you should hear me saying that settlements are okay. You should see us hear hear loud and clear. Or let me hear loud and clear me saying, from a policy perspective, we believe they are a barrier to peace. From a legal perspective, we believe they are inconsistent with international law. Yeah, but you don't believe that they're illegal. You know, I will let the the lawyers, of which I am not, speak to the difference between those two terms, if any. But uh, on behalf of the United States, if we any, do, if any, well, we do we entire, do not believe the they are consistent with, the with whole, international the law. Entire point of the Hansel Memorandum when it was written in 1978. Believe me, I've done a lot of looking into this. Was that it was ambiguous? That it did not 
put the United States down as having a position that settlements were illegal or not illegal or you know totally fine, um, but that it was intended to show unhappiness or your <clears throat> disagreement with with settlement policy. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you say that this announcement on Friday w removes the ambiguity, <coughs> I, I, I'm just going to, that doesn't, it, it restores the ambiguity. So, because what sorry. the previous administration did, what the previous Secretary of State did, was that, is that to say that the, that the U.S. no longer regards settlement activity, quote unquote, per se, per, per se. as being inconsistent or illegitimate. That seemed to remove ambiguity. This restores the previous ambiguity. How am I wrong? Uh, so I don't find anything ambiguous about a statement from the United States that we believe the Israeli government settled pro settlement program is inconsistent with federal law. I find that to be a very clear okay. federal uh, international, uh, inter law. Sorry, international law, of course, a very clear, unambig unambiguous statement. Um, I cannot speak to the reasoning behind a memo that was written in 1978, obviously. I was not here, but I can tell you our intention now is to be very clear about what we believe. Yeah. So can I Sorry, go ahead. And I'm glad you mentioned 1978 because there is a lawyerly or legal definition that was you know, established uh, then and so on. Plus, you guys are uh, signatories to all the UN resolutions, 242 and so on, that basically say the settlements are illegal. Uh, so I don't know why we, you, every so many years you feel that you have to reassert or you know, dis dispel the ambiguity and so on. Uh, let me ask you a couple You would rather questions. we hadn't made this statement? No, I'm saying okay. make the statement Fair. all the time. Fair enough. I'm just, I'm just, no, no, I'm no, just, the state, I'm just the being statement, clear. The statement is important because the previous administration uh, basically sought to, you know, to undo that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's why it is timely and it is important. I'm not saying it's not important. I want to ask you a couple of questions, um, uh, but also I want to say for the record, uh, Matt, you know, uh, with all sympathies with, with Navalny and so on. But, you know, Palestinian prisoners die uh, in Israeli jails almost on a weekly basis uh, under torture. It would, be, you know, it would be great for the United States of America to say this should be unacceptable uh, as well. We w so just to be very clear, we want every prisoner, every detainee anywhere right. in the world to be, be treated humanely, to be treated in accordance with international law. That is right. not just true in Russia. It's including true, it's including true, it, Israeli it, prison. Hold, hold on, sorry, just yeah. let me finish. I, and I will say what I have, what I have to say. Sure. As I was going to say is that's true in Russia, it's true in Israel, it's true everywhere in the world. Okay, excellent. Uh, let me ask you about uh, Samaha Ismail, the Palestinian uh, American woman that was arrested early in, in February. Can you update us any any new development with this case? Uh, so I will say that we have obtained uh, uh, consular access and have officials from our embassy have met with her. Um, we are in contact with her and our family. We are providing all appropriate consular assistance as we always do in these cases. Uh, there's not a lot I can say about the case. Uh, right. It remains a, a legal matter, but we are in contact with her family, her and her family. Yeah, but she was apparently arrested for a Facebook post, I mean, <clears throat> nothing else. Uh, let me ask you about the humanitarian situation uh, in Gaza. It seems that Israel is doing everything possible to hinder the entry of, uh, of humanitarian assistance uh, into, into Gaza, you know, by denying visas to humanitarian workers, by uh, shooting policemen that try to organize, you know, these things and so on. So, uh, um, uh, you know, so what are you doing to facilitate this uh, human um, human assistant shipments and so on. I mean, <coughs> kids are coming out and saying, we want a piece of bread. I mean, it, it's really, so I, it's hard to imagine this is happening in the 21st century. Let me say a few things about that. First, as I've said a, a number of times, we continue to be at the forefront of advocating for increased, sustained humanitarian assistance to benefit innocent Palestinians in Gaza. Um, uh, we continue to be the largest humanitarian donor to the Palestinian people. With respect to two specific points you raised there, first, the delivery of humanitarian assistance inside Gaza, which right now uh, uh, is a difficult situation. So <clears throat> you have had this situation where um, uh, the, Isra the problem right now is not just getting humanitarian assistance into Gaza through either Rafah or Karim Shalom, but getting it distributed inside Gaza uh, because of a lack of uh, ability to secure shipments. There is a problem in that the, the police that were providing security to those shipments inside Gaza, some of them are members of Hamas. Some of them are not. 
And so Israel does have a legitimate right to try to um, hold members of Hamas accountable uh, as part of the ongoing military operation that they're conducting. But at the same time, we want to see the ability of shipments to be safely delivered inside Gaza and not looted by criminal gangs and others. So that's a matter that we are in ongoing conversation with both the government of Israel and our humanitarian partners on the ground about how to solve. It is a live question that we're dealing with every day. We haven't reached a solution yet, but it's something we're actively engaged on because it's important not just that the humanitarian assistance get into Gaza, but that it get to the people that need it. With respect to the second question that you raised uh, as it pertains to visa, so our position is clear. It's that all regional governments must do what is necessary to enable this humanitarian response. That includes allowing international staff the freedom of movement to ramp up and help the response. And we hope all governments in the region will rapidly approve all requested visas for UN and INGO workers in an expeditious fashion. Uh, one, uh, lastly, uh, <coughs> yesterday, um, the Israeli Prime Minister told Face the Nation that, uh, you know, any deal or any pause would only delay entry into Rafah. Do you have any comment on that? So, um, I don't want to speak to a hypothetical, because right now we are trying to secure a pause uh, that would get hostages out, that would get humanitarian assistance in and would greatly alleviate the suffering of the, the Palestinian people. What happens after that? <clears throat> I think it's too early to say. We are focused right now on trying to achieve that pause. We've had uh, uh, various officials from the United States government engaged in conversations last week and over the weekend to try to secure it. We think a deal is possible. We think a deal can be reached, and ultimately, that's where we're focusing our efforts. Thank you. Uh, Leon, I told Leon I'd yeah. come in. No, I'll come in next. I'm interested to hear what your take is and your reaction on uh, the uh, government of the Palestinian Authority, which has resigned. Uh, that resignation has been accepted by President Abbas. Um, how do you see that? Do you welcome that? Do you think it's a first step to, towards a reform? And who would you support uh, as a gov future government? So uh, with respect to uh, both the resignation and a future government, ultimately the leadership of the Palestinian Authority uh, is a question for the Palestinians themselves to decide. It's not a matter that I'm going to comment on from here. But we do welcome steps uh, for the PA to reform and revitalize itself. The uh, Secretary has encouraged uh, uh, the PA to take those steps in com when he's been in, in conversations with uh, President Abbas and others and when we've traveled to Ramallah. That's something you've heard this President speak to, and it's something that we will continue to pursue. We think those steps are positive. We think uh, um, <clears throat> they're important, uh, an important step to achieving a reunited uh, Gaza and West Bank under the Palestinian Authority, so we will con continue to, con uh, to encourage them to take those steps. So you think they're the actual resignation is a step in that direction. Again, I don't want to speak to the actual resignation because it, when it comes to personnel matters, those are questions that should be left to the Palestinians. But we have been engaged with them uh, on the need to reform and revitalize the government, and we have seen them start to take steps in that direction, and we welcome them. But, yeah, you say you don't want to comment on the specific resign, resignations, but then, you, I, but then you welcome it. Uh, we are welcoming steps towards PA reform. There well, have been it, a, the, are the, the resignations the, the, part of the, the steps toward, uh, so toward reform? I, 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 I mean, come on, I just, I just don't know, want to we're speak. Not idiots here. I just don't want to speak to. Uh, I'm well aware of that, Matt. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to speak to uh, a personnel matter, but. I think you have seen. I, I, I understand a, gover a government matter. When it comes to the, the personnel who are leading the government, it's not something we have ever wanted to speak to. Yeah. But, well, I know, but, but then you, but, you say that, but, and then you come out let me and say, finish. well, this President, is a good thing. President Abbas has said he is going to take steps towards reforming and revitalizing the, the Palestinian Authority. He has said that directly to the Secretary, and uh, we welcome him taking those steps. So we welcome him bringing in fresh blood. Uh, we certainly would welcome new, um, uh, you know, uh, revitalized, reformed Palestinian Authority. Go ahead. But not to comment on the <laughs> Go ahead, Nadia. Just, just yeah. One, one last thing on this. You think it was necessary for the government to resign in order to that, I, that I'm not forward. That I'm not going to, going to comment. I will let the Palestinian Authority speak to that. I don't think it's appropriate for me to, to comment on, uh, on that from here. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions. One to follow up on Saeed's question. So you're aware that uh, the UN, uh, human, uh, humanitarian organizations in Gaza said that 85,000 Gazans could die as a result of starvation, disease, or bombing. <coughs> so what practically can the administration do to alter this reality? Um, 
So you won't be seen as <coughs> literally repeating rhetoric when you said we ask Israelis to allow so. human aid organization to to expedite the visas, to allow trucks to come, etc. Because these things on the ground does not happen. So can so. we make sure that these people won't face this um, death either by starvation or by disease? So there are two incredibly important things we are trying to pursue to alleviate the suffering of the humanitarian people. One is, as I said, to increase the flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza to make sure it's sustained and to <coughs> break down any obstacles to actually being delivered to those uh, who are in need. But there is a second, and that, uh, and that work is ongoing. It's something we've been working on for some time. And there, uh, as you know, we are involved at a really kind of granular technical level um, with the governments of Egypt, the government of Israel, uh, and international partners in the region, and uh, have been engaged with it really since the immediate days after October 7th. But there is another uh, way that we could help alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, and that is to achieve a humanitarian pause that would allow more humanitarian assistance to come in to Gaza and would allow more humanitarian assistance to get to those who need. It would allow people better freedom of movement to move around Gaza and get to humanitarian assistance. And we have worked with the governments of Egypt and Israel and Qatar to achieve such a proposal. And we need Hamas to say yes. And so if Hamas wants to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, they could agree to the proposal that we have put forward to achieve a humanitarian pause and get more humanitarian assistance in. So when I see people calling for more to be done to allow humanitarian assistance in, we fundamentally agree with that. And everyone inside the United States government that is responsible for this brief is working on it. But Hamas plays a role, too. So and they Hamas and, and, and uh, Hamas, I say Hamas plays a role, too. And the people that are calling for us to do more should be calling for Hamas to get out of the way and allow more humanitarian okay, so assistance to come in as well. The government is fine with all the conditions that will allow the, humanitarian there, there, there are issues that we have to work through with the government of Israel all the time. And we've been quite clear. We've spoken to them from this podium a number of times. The secretary has spoken to them. I'm just saying that's not the only pro impediment to humanitarian assistance getting in. If Hamas would agree to a, humanita a humanitarian pause, a temporary ceasefire, that would go a long ways to alleviating the immediate suffering of the Palestinian people. Okay. Uh, my second question is, the Secretary was asked um, uh, on the, during the trip uh, to comment about the uh, Netanyahu plan for Gaza. Mm -hmm. And he said he's not going to comment because he hasn't seen it. So the U.S. government has not seen it officially. <coughs> the White House dismissed it somehow as disagreement among friends. This plan, I'm sure you've seen it, not officially, but you read about it, fundamentally clashes with everything that the administration calling, including just now when you talked about two-state solution. So is really the two-state solution a mirage, considering Netanyahu himself and his government don't believe in it at all? So who are you going to implement it with? So with respect to the plan, first of all, uh, again, we have not, you're right, that we have not engaged with the government of Israel. We've seen press reporting, but we haven't sat down and have a detailed converse, had a detailed conversation with the government of Israel uh, about this plan yet. So I will refrain, refrain from <coughs> specific comment until we've had the chance to do so. But we have been very clear about what our position is with respect to the governance of Gaza moving forward with, when it comes to questions about the reoccupation of Gaza and the reduction or potential reduction of any uh, uh, territory of Gaza. And we'll continue to be very clear about that publicly and privately. And when it comes to this question of the two, st of, of two states, all we can do, and you've heard me say this before, is present our vision for uh, peace and security in the Middle East and make clear to the government of Israel and make clear to the people of Israel that there is a path forward for lasting security, for better relations with Israel's neighbors, uh, and they have to take it. And if they're ready to do it, we are ready to work with them on how to achieve that vision. But you have so many, you have so many tools. Just the last, my last follow-up, yeah. sorry. But you have so much leverage over the Israelis. And this is fundamental vision of the president. So. You can use all the revelries you, wa you want, including weapons that you sell to Israel, to so, make sure that this plan is on the, at least on the right path for implementation, considering we have like short time between now and November. So one thing I will say about that that people often tend to forget is that Israel, like other countries in the region, is a sovereign country that makes its own decisions. The United States does not dictate to Israel what it must do, just as we don't dictate to any country what it must do. 
We present what we believe Unless are the. Invaded. We present what the we believe are the. <laughs> good one, Matt. We, we present no. I mean, come, but but come on, yeah. It's we we present stand up hour at the in the briefing room. We present what we believe are the best proposals to to achieve peace and security. And we will continue to do that, but Israel has to make its own decisions, just as every sovereign, independent country has to make its own decisions. Now, I just um, have, what, what did you say? What, what did you mean when you just said to, uh, uh, that they have to take it? They have to. It doesn't mean that they have to take it in that we can dictate to them. What I meant by they have to take it is okay. we can present all the options in the world. We can't control whether they take it or not. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, a question about today's meeting between Secretary Blinken and the current Prime Minister. Why this meeting has happened at this time? Is there any connection between this invitation to the current <coughs> Prime Minister and your discussion with the Iraqi government about the evolution and the future of your forces in Iraq? So with respect to that meeting, the Secretary and the Prime Minister today underscored the importance of the U.S. partnership with the Iraqi Kurdistan region in the context of their mutual enduring commitment to regional security and their shared values, including go good governance and respect for human rights. Secretary Blinken expressed support for constructive collaboration between the Iraqi government and the KRG, as well as greater unity within the IK IKR to advance stability and economic prosperity for all of Iraq's people. Um, this is not the first time uh, the Secretary has met with the Prime Minister. We have done so in other contexts. Um, uh, with respect to the timing of the meeting, there's nothing more about it and that we wanted to continue the conversations we've had. And you talked about the unity among the Kurds and Secretary Blinken, in his remarks at the beginning of the meeting, he touched that issue too. What concerns do you have about the unity among the Kurds? Uh, I don't want to speak to that beyond what the, the Secretary said in his remarks. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. I wanted to circle back to the question that uh, Saeed asked about the American woman detained in uh, the West Bank and as well as the, the two brothers in Gaza. I know you are constantly doing assessments. Are you entertaining the possibility that these three or and any other Americans detained by Israel post October 7th may be detained uh, Unlawfully or, or wrongfully detained. I don't have I don't have any any ability to offer that assessment at that at this point. We did meet with the two brothers today. We, um, uh, we received consular access to them. Officials for our embassy in Jerusalem met with these two brothers at a detention facility inside uh, Israel. Uh, we had been in contact with their family. This was our first uh, time to speak directly to the two brothers, uh, and so I don't have any assessment to offer uh, about their case. Other than that, is is, is true for. Uh, all Americans in Israel or anywhere around the world, their safety and security is uh, our first priority. But like you often say when, when, when Americans are detained, say, in Russia, I mean, that, that it's something, I know, is there, there's a process that you go through to, to establish that? There is a process that we go through, but we are just at the be the beginning stages of gathering information about these individual cases. We just met um, uh, with the first detainee you mentioned last week. We just met with the two brothers today. So uh, we're nowhere near making that determination. Cheers. Go ahead. Thank you. And my question is on Mexico. Uh, has there been any engagement with the Mexican government about the president of Mexico's decision to publicly broadcast the cell phone number of a New York Times reporter? In the end, she's an American citizen, and U.S. press groups have called this action as dangerous. So I don't have any uh, diplomatic conversations to read out, but you might have heard the White House press secretary speak to this question on Friday. Uh, we support the independent free press um, uh, when it does its work around the world. That includes in Mexico, includes any country in the world, and we wouldn't want to see any action taken that would jeopardize uh, any individual or any reporter's safety. Alex, go ahead, and I'll come to Jen, and then Gita. Thank you. Uh, going back to Russia, uh, does the department have any position on Russia's forthcoming uh, presidential election, given the events of the past couple of weeks, not only murdering of you know, Navalny, but also they didn't let the main challenger, uh, Nadezhda? Well, I don't think it should be a surprise to anyone in, in the world that this will not be a free and fair election. And uh, on hostages, if I may, um, do you have any reaction to uh, uh, the criticism that uh, you know coming from different corners, uh, from the Hill, from uh, other branches of the government, uh, saying that the fact that your, your approach to, towards uh, you know dual citizens actually does embolden you know folks like Putin to uh, go after more dual citizens. You know when the secretary last year promised that the State Department will consider Karim uh you know designation as a wrongful detained, it was a year ago. Now you had more and more U.S. and dual citizens being arrested in Russia. Do you see any connection there? Because there's a criticism uh, that I, your 
<laughs> I do not. All I'll say, sometimes I get this question about dual citizens. We don't see, we don't look at dual citizens differently than any other citizen. An American is American, and we try to, to uh, do what we can to ensure the safety and security uh, of every American overseas. Jen, and then Gita, and then Olivia. Um, Go ahead. Matt, I know you don't comment on hostage negotiations, but any comment on the discussions in Qatar today? Uh, we understand there's been some movement on the Hamas position. That's positive. Uh, do you have anything on this? I don't want to offer any comment other than what I said a moment ago, which is um, uh, we did make progress in these conversations over the weekend and in the last few days. Uh, we continue to believe that a deal is possible, and we're going to uh, continue to pursue it. And do you have any updates on the Americans who are believed to be hostages? Is it still your assessment that there are six? It's still our assessment that six, and I don't have any uh, uh, information about their condition. And then separately, um, there's an IAEA report that just came out saying that the uh, Iranian production of near bomb grade uranium has fallen. Do you have any comment or comment? So my understanding is that report has not been made public, uh, and so I don't have any comments on reports that have not been made public, but we remain seriously concerned about Iran's continued expansion of its nuclear program in ways that have no credible civilian purpose, including its continued production of highly enriched uranium. And we appreciate the IEA's extensive efforts to engage Iran on longstanding questions to, related to Iran's safeguard obligations. Gita, go ahead. Um, Syrian Observatory uh, has reported that there was a missile attack on the U.S. base in, the, um, in Syria's uh, Conoco gas field yesterday. And then today, there was a, an attack on a fuel tanker of the Syrian Democratic Forces, and it says likely by ISIS. Now, the U.S. forces are in Syria in that area to control the resurgence of uh, ISIS. I was wondering if the administration has seen any kind of a collaboration between <coughs> ISIS that, and the Iranian-backed forces over there, the <coughs> militia, uh, post-October 7th um, attack on Israel. So I'm not aware of, of any reports or assessments of such collaboration. I'm happy to take that back and get you um, a more detailed answer. And with respect to the attack, I would defer to my colleagues at the Pentagon. Olivia. Thanks, Matt. Um, just to clarify, has the U.S. received any update on the military or humanitarian plan for Rafah from the Israeli government? We have not. Okay, so we have not. We've seen the we've seen the comments from the prime minister that he only received them, I think, last night. We have not yet been briefed on them. Uh, you know, unless there have been some preliminary conversations at the embassy level in Jerusalem, I'm not aware of. But we have not received any kind of detailed briefing at this point. Okay, the prime minister mentioned uh, as part of that plan the potential of moving citizens from Rafa north, north of Rafa. Uh, understanding you haven't seen the plan, even in the abstract, does that sound like a conceivable plan for 1.4 million people? I don't think I should comment on the abstract before we see a detailed plan. Okay, and sorry, um, just to revisit something that Saeed raised, which is the Prime Minister publicly saying that Rafa, an operation in Rafa will continue whether or not a hostage deal is reached. Doesn't that disincentivize Hamas from signing on to something that is predicated on a sustained ceasefire? Uh, you know, I think Hamas should want to sign on to this deal because they want to see a humanitarian pause that allows more humanitarian assistance to move in to people in Gaza. So do they? Uh, they should. I said they should. I said they ought to want to see that. So when it comes to Hamas's incentives, I, you know, I, far be it from me to uh, offer assessments about what incentivizes them and incentivizes them and what doesn't. But uh, I would think if they truly cared about the Palestinian people, they should agree to, to uh, the deal that is on the table because it will greatly allevi alleviate the suffering of those Palestinian people. Last one, just on yeah. the prime minister's comments. It, he said that after the Rafah uh, operation, total victory would be weeks away, not months away. Based on the military updates that the U.S. has been receiving from the Israeli government, does that seem conceivable? I just don't want to offer any assessments on the military campaign. I've always tried to, to keep from doing so here. Humera, go ahead. Um, just want to clarify one thing you said. Uh, you said we've had progress over the weekend. Um, you mean like the very last couple of days, right? I mean, we've had progress with, with um, the conversations we've had between Egypt, Israel, the United States, and Qatar, yes. Right, and based on the progress there, you're still a, are you hopeful or like not hopeful, but do you see a, uh, a deal more likely after this weekend before Ramadan? I can't make that assessment because it depends on Hamas. We believe a deal is possible and we hope Hamas will agree to one. Um, go, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, in, in light of the, and I know that there's been, they did not denial that, uh, you know, that there's a illegal settlements, but there's a <coughs> Jerusalem Post article, February 24th stating that the Biden administration has declared 
uh, Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria is illegal. What is your response to previous Secretary of uh, State Mike Pompeo's comments February 23rd he made on Twitter? And I quote, Judea and Samaria are rightful parts of the Jewish homeland and Israelis have a right to live there. President Biden's decision to overturn our policy and call Israeli settlements illegal will not further the cause of peace. It rewards Hamas for its brutal attacks on October 7th and punishes Israel instead. These Israeli communities, he said, are not standing in the way of peace. Militant Palestinian terrorism is in the follow-up. Well, I don't think you will be surprised to hear that I disagree with those comments. Um, and I should reiterate again that it has been the longstanding U.S. position across both Democratic and Republican administrations, not just the Biden administration, not just the Obama administration, but Republican administrations as well, that settlements are a barrier to peace, they're an obstacle to peace. We believe they weaken, not strengthen, Israel's security. Okay, if President Biden and Secretary Blinken uh, think if, if they don't, if you don't agree that it's, it's illegal, if you if you believe that it's a, a barrier, as you said, uh, to peace, um, so uh, would your response for Israelis that, to live in their own land of Judea and Samaria, where where is the justice? The question is in allowing illegal immigrants coming across our southern border to settle wherever they want, causing havoc here in the United States, murdering our citizens, and robbing the American taxpayer. Well, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> I would say with respect to that, um, you have seen this administration put forward a deal to further secure the southern border, uh, and unfortunately, Republicans in Congress have not taken it up. Thank Go you, ahead. Sir. Uh, Pakistan is moving ahead to build a pipeline that will transport natural gas from Iran a move it says is needed to meet the country's energy needs. U.S. expressed concerns uh, on this project in the past. You still have those concerns? Uh, I'll have to take that one back and get you an answer. Sir, uh, two major political parties in Pakistan are forming a new government, and uh, still there are massive reports of rigging. So do you welcome the formation of new government, or do you believe that investigation uh, should be done before the formal government. So with respect to the formation of a, a new government, that's a Pakistani process led by Pakistanis. We're not a party to it, and it's not something that uh, I would comment on. We want to see a government move forward in a way that reflects the will of the Pakistani people. With respect to investigations into uh, reported irregularities, we want to see those investigations proceed. We want to see them wrapped up as soon as possible. So the Indian security forces have responded to the farmers' protests by firing iron pellets and using drones to drop tear gas uh, shells on the civilian protests. We have seen some horrible images. Uh, what are your concerns on the barbaric, on this barbaric treatment of the civilian farmers? I, I, just, I haven't seen those reports. I'll have to take it back. Go ahead here, and then we'll wrap up for today. Thank you so much. Uh, the question is regarding a January 31st incident in which two Navy SEALs lost their lives at the coast of Somalia. So a U.S. District Court in Richmond charged four individuals who were allegedly carrying Pakistani identification cards. And it is said that these individuals were transporting suspected Iranian-made weapons to Houthis in Yemen. So do United States raise this matter with the concerned authorities? And also, I want to know, uh, do you have any details from a Department of Treasury or from Justice Department? What will be the further procedure as United States have done the uh, sanction on the individuals and entities who are linked with Iranian weapons transport. So the justice, with, with regard to this case, the I don't have any updates with regard to the second question, but with regard to this case, the Justice Department released a very detailed statement about this, uh, I believe in connection to an unsealed indictment on Friday. Um, it's an ongoing legal matter, and because of that, I'm not going to comment further. And with that, we've got to wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.